Good evening. I'm Mehdi Hassan. Imagine, if you will, it's mid-December. The Democratic president-elect is getting ready to take office in a few weeks. The economy is in shambles after a national crisis. Americans are losing their homes and jobs in their droves. And the only hope of much-needed relief comes from Washington, D.C. The incoming president asks his top team how big they need to go on stimulus. Here's what they say. Christie mentioned a trillion dollars, causing Ram to sputter like a cartoon character, spitting out a bad meal. There's no bleeping way, Ram said. Any number that began with a T would be a non-starter with lots of Democrats, not to mention Republicans. I turned to Joe, who nodded in assent. If you haven't picked up by now, that was former President Barack Obama when Joe Biden was his right-hand man. Obama describes how a trillion-dollar pitch in December 2008 wasn't deemed viable in his new memoir, A A Promised Land. Back then, Obama listened to his advisers, including his veep, Joe Biden, keeping the stimulus lower than what he and many economists thought necessary in order to try and muster up bipartisan support. And what happened? Not a single Republican voted for it anyways. And as Biden's current chief of staff, Ron Klain, recently said of that bill, as big and as bold, as aggressive as the Recovery Act was in 2009, I think most experts now look back and say it wasn't large enough, and our recovery lagged as a result. Fast forward to today, President Joe Biden, president, now he is, is in a similar spot. But is this a different Biden and a different Democratic Party, one determined to show they've learned the lessons of 2008, 2009? Here's what new Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said about that today. To that end, Democrats welcome the ideas and input of our Senate Republican colleagues. The only thing we cannot accept is a package that is too small or too narrow to pull our country out of this emergency. We cannot repeat the mistake of 2009. To that end, President Biden is proposing a big, bold $1.9 trillion COVID relief package. But, surprise, it's already getting pushback from Republicans. In fact, Biden met with nine GOP senators at the White House today. Notably, none from leadership, though. A 10th Senator, Mike Rounds, joined by phone. They've proposed a bill just one-third the size of Biden's, just $600 billion, paring down several of Biden's key proposals. For example, $1,000 checks. $1,000 checks instead of $1,400 checks. 300 a week in jobless benefits, not 400. And 160 billion for vaccines compared to Biden's ask of $416 billion. The GOP plan also cuts out money again for states and cities and cuts out Biden's $15 minimum wage proposal. The White House says the meeting was not a forum for negotiation, but did express optimism that they could reach an agreement both bold and bipartisan. There is uh, historic uh, evidence uh, that it is possible to take uh, a number of paths, uh, including uh, through reconciliation, if that's the path that is pursued, and for the vote to be bipartisan. But it's important to him that he hears this group uh, out on their concerns, on their ideas. He's always open to making uh, this package stronger. But his view is that uh, the size of the package needs to be commensurate with the crisis crises we're facing, the dual crises we're facing, hence uh, why he proposed proposed a package that's 1.9 trillion dollars. Democratic lawmakers have already signaled they're willing to move forward with COVID relief through a simple majority process known as budget reconciliation, as the press secretary Jen Psaki mentioned there, without GOP support. And Republicans are already crying They're already crying foul on that, too, suggesting that Biden would be betraying his calls for unity if budget reconciliation is used. But hold on, a majority of Americans, including Republicans, support bigger checks, support higher spending. So what's not united or bipartisan about that? Yet even very mainstream media outlets like Politico pose the question, how serious is Biden about bipartisanship? I'd suggest the media shouldn't fall for a GOP bad faith narrative, and nor should they only be asking Democrats to be bipartisan. We certainly won't be on this show. And as far as those still griping about Biden's promise of unity, I point them to the president's own words from a week ago. 
if, if you pass a piece of legislation that breaks down on party lines, but it gets passed, it doesn't mean there wasn't unity. It just means it wasn't bipartisan. So maybe it is a different Joe Biden, and maybe that's a good thing. Joining me now is Nobel Prize winning economist and best-selling author Joseph Stiglitz. He's a professor at Columbia University and was chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors during the Clinton administration. Uh, professor Stiglitz, thanks so much for coming on the show. You were one of the many economists over a decade ago saying President Obama needed to go very big, over a trillion dollars on his recovery bill post the crash. Obviously, that's not how it worked out then. Are you confident that Biden took that lesson to heart, that the Democrats are going to do things differently this time around? It seems that way. And, and you know, the data that we're getting in it should be reinforcing uh, the conviction that we need to do more. Just today, the bipartisan uh, independent CBO, Congressional Budget Office, says that under without more support, we are going to have an elevated level of unemployment until the end of the decade. Can you believe that? Until the end of the decade. So that's their forecast under current uh, proposal, you know, programs. And we need substantial amount of money uh, to get us out of the hole. Another way of putting it is the following. If it turns out that things work really well and we have a robust recovery, then we can always scale back. But the lesson of 2009 yeah. is you get one big bite of the apple and it's going to be hard to get another round going forward. Yeah, it's better to be uh, too big than too small, uh, especially when people's lives on the line. Uh, we were seeing there a moment ago, Susan Collins uh, was on screen there, Republican senator uh, from Maine. She's in that group of senators who went to the White House this evening uh, to meet with Joe Biden. They're offering $600 billion, uh, Professor Stiglitz. $600 billion. That's a paltry amount, isn't it, given the scale of the challenge? I, it's not sufficient, that's clear. And let me make clear also that the things that they've cut out are really, really important things. And, you know, one of the things you were pointing out is they've cut out aid to state and local uh, governments. Um, that's a big mistake. We need that aid. There, these The states and localities have balanced budget framework, which means when the revenues go down, they have to cut their expenditures. And that means uh, a destimulus. <laughs> it's taking money out of the economy. And uh, we call that an automatic destabilizer. Um, and remember, the stakes and localities are absolutely essential in providing health care, education, welfare, things that ordinary Americans really depend on. And, one of the big mistakes in 2008-9 is we didn't provide enough of assistance to state and localities. And a decade later, by 2019, we still had not gotten back to the level of employment uh, that we had before the Great Recession. So it shows you, you know, without assistance, uh, this is going to have a devastating effect and it's going to be one of the reasons that we won't be able to get back to uh, a good level of employment by the end of the decade. And it's interesting you mentioned state and local governments. Uh, GOP lawmakers in Washington might not be on board with another big relief bill, but that doesn't necessarily trickle down to Republican governors uh, who recognize the scale of the challenges you mentioned. Uh, have a listen to what West Virginia Governor uh, Jim Justice of the Republican Party said to MSNBC's Craig Melvin earlier today. At this point in time in this nation, we need to go big. We need to quit counting the egg sucking legs on the cows and count the cows and just move and move forward and move right now. We need to go big. And if we waste some money now, well, we waste some money. It often gets lost in the D.C. focus of our media coverage, but states are in a dire situation. They need help from the federal government. And it doesn't matter whether you're a red state or a blue state. You're in the same financial situation when this crisis is hitting you. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, there's an old expression, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, 
if we don't provide enough money, we are going to do damage. The way economists talk about it is hysteresis. What it means is that firms go bankrupt. They don't go unbankrupt after the recession, after the pandemic is put under control. Household balance sheets are devastated. Firm balance sheets are devastated. And all of that means that we're going to have a, a weaker recovery unless we go big. Yeah. Uh, and that's the big challenge ahead of us. Uh, the president has come out in favor of a $15 minimum wage. He's even signed an executive order saying his agencies should look at a way at bringing it in for the federal government. Uh, Congress is considering a bill to make it law by 2025. Uh, would a $15 minimum wage be a game changer in terms of wage stagnation and poverty debate, or is it too little, too late? Well, uh, let me put it in perspective. Uh, most Americans don't realize that the minimum wage today, adjusted for inflation, is the same level that it was some 60 to 65 years ago. Can you believe people at the bottom have not gotten a pay raise for 60, 65 years in a country who, where there's been growth? Uh, obviously, uh, what we're talking about is just catch up. Uh, we're catching up to where we should have been. And uh, what he's asking is not too much. As you say, the, the right question is, is it enough? But uh, he's getting pushback even on this $15. So my view is let's, let, let's get this nailed down and then we can see what the effects are. All the evidence is that it will actually promote economic growth. You know, Seattle increased its minimum wage and it was really good for for Seattle. So uh, my view is let's go forward with fifteen dollars uh, and then reevaluate where we are then. It's a good point, and I hope we do that. Uh, one thing that isn't on the horizon, though, Professor Stiglitz, is a wealth tax, as pitched by both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren during the primaries. How crucial do you think a wealth tax is in the fight against growing inequality in this country? Can you make a serious dent in wealth inequality without a wealth tax? Um, let me first put it in perspective. Wealth inequality is twice the magnitude of income inequality, roughly... Uh, the top 1% has 20, 20 some percent wow. of income, but the top 1% has some 40 some percent of wealth. But there are measures, you know, I'm, I'm in support of a wealth tax and uh, of a wealth tax of the kind that Elizabeth Warren has put forward uh, would I think be good for the economy. But uh, there are some other uh, you might call it interim measures. Um, we have a regressive income tax system. That means that those at the top are paying a lower tax rate than those down below. It's unusual for any country. You know, we talk about a progressive tax system. We have a regressive tax system. So closing those loopholes, making people who earn money by speculating, pay a tax equal at least to those who work for a living. You know, why should uh, a, a, a Wall Street a speculator pay a lower tax rate than a plumber, um, you know, or somebody who really works hard for, for a living? It, 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 you know, not that the gamblers don't work hard, but it's, uh, you know, let's, let's be clear, there's no justification for subsidizing an effect. Uh, the speculators. So to me, what? closing a lot of those loopholes would uh, may be a big stride to reducing our inequality. You mentioned the uh, Wall Street speculators and gamblers, uh, which leads me to my last question that I have to ask you before I let you go. The recent chaos in the markets uh, surrounding GameStop and AMC and the hedge funds who lost all that money to the Reddit day traders. What did you make of that whole episode? What lesson do you think we should learn from it? Well, the speculative markets are very volatile. Uh, they've always been a rich person's gambling casino. That one of the things that's happened now is that 
uh, with trading platforms like Robinhood that have lowered the transaction costs, that uh, they've made access to these markets more widely available. But you know, there's a basic principle in economics called uh, there's no free lunch. And what Robinhood is doing is using that information and selling it to uh, the other uh, uh, hedge funds. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, it allows them to front run, to engage in other kinds of activities. It allows them to, uh, uh, you know, uh, take advantage of these uh, day traders, as they're often called, uh, small traders. And in the end, what worries me is that the small traders are going to get burned. And so the lesson for, from this is that we need more transparency, more regulation. I hope that the new head of the uh, SEC will uh, be receptive to uh, more regulation. You should not allow the sale of that kind of uh, data, uh, especially yeah. giving preferential information to some firms, you're creating asymmetries of information uh, and that may, means the markets are not working well for ordinary investors. Uh, so to me, uh, it opens up a wide discussion about how do we make markets really work well and work well for ordinary investors, not for, not for the hedge funds. And that's going yes. to be regulations about transparency. And I think eventually taxes on these kinds of speculative trade, which do nothing but increase instability, but not societal yep. welfare. I agree with you, and I think it's been a very revealing episode uh, about the way these markets work or don't work. Uh, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, thank you so much for your time and your insights tonight. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.